consideration. How big is Pluto? That's a great question. I will get back to you on that. I think I'll look that one up myself. Um, it's not very big relative to the other planets, um, but you know, relative to other objects around it. Is planet nine real? Oh, you know what? I skipped another question. I don't want to. Um, what is the core of gas giants? That's quite interesting. Core of gas giants, we believe, is a special little form of matter. It's, um, it's a lot of hydrogen and helium that we said, but because of all the pressure, think about how when we go into the ocean, the deeper you are in the ocean, the more pressure there is on top of it. Well, it works the same way in these gas planets. The deeper you go into the gas planets, the more gravity is pushing down you, the more stuff is on top of you. And so it becomes this, this liquid, solid gas thing. Um, but in the end, we can't really go there, and we don't know all too well. This is all kind of speculation. Now, back to the Is Planet Nine Real? I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not qualified to really speak on it. I'm, I'm just an undergraduate. Um, if I were to take a guess, Probably not, but um, I think that's a, definitely a better question for Dr. Halicus here, who is far more qualified to, uh, to talk about cutting edge stuff in the field than I am. Um, Cole, mentioned, Cole mentioned that the planet Neptune was discovered by math and all the you know, current arguments for a planet nine are looking at data and saying mathematically, it looks like there might be something else out there. Um, that's a couple people saying that. There are lots of other people saying, no, the numbers aren't right. We don't see that in the data. Definitely, definitely still a little bit of discussion going on about that, but unlikely. Um, someone asked, what are Saturn's rings made out of? It's made out of little tiny particles of rock, ice, and dust. Um, they also really vary in size, not nearly as much as the asteroid belt but there are a series of rings and it's just a lot of rocks and ice that, that make it up. Um, how did Neptune and Uranus get made? That's a great question. Um, when the solar system was forming, uh, it was initially was this big thing of dust uh, and then it became its own thing over time as the gravity kind of pulled down and eventually we got these things called planetesimals. Now it's a pretty oversimplified version and we might be discussing it in the future. So I, uh, and, and just for time reasons, can't really get too into it. We have these things called planetesimals. And planetesimals were like, were really, are what asteroids are made of, like debris of what could have been planets. Uh, now these planetesimals came together and eventually some planetesimals got enough mass where they, they were able to attract gas in the solar system. And so that's how uh, Jupiter and Saturn, these planetesimals came together. And they got heavy enough where they could bring in a lot of gas. And then this gas just couldn't escape the pull of, uh, of gravity, similar to how our atmosphere and the oxygen in our atmosphere can't escape Earth. But Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus are a lot more massive than Earth is, and it's able to hold in a lot more stuff. Do, uh, oh, um, how did, okay, yeah. Do other planets have rings? Yes, I believe all planets have rings. I think Saturn's are just the most noticeable. Um, anything... Oh, the gas giants, definitely, yeah. Oh, all the gas giants, okay. Yeah, they're, they're definitely large enough to have a gravitational pull. It's just uh, Uranus definitely has the most observable ones. So oh. have, but Uranus has them, Neptune has them, Jupiter even, yeah. How common is water on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn? That is a great question. I actually don't know all too well. I know, like, the famous... So ones with like water, but that's, that's really it. Right, yeah, there's a big like hot button famous ones. So, um, you know, um, we've got this moon of Jupiter. So the, um, the big moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons um, are um, Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. And Europa in particular um, is a real candidate for possibly some liquid water below an icy surface of that moon. Um, and tight, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Saturn has a moon named Enceladus, and we've seen water geysers actually spray from cracks in the surface of Enceladus. Um, so definitely um, 
a number of evidences of actual water for certain on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, but a couple of other um, instances where we hypothesize it might be there and even some future missions will look at that. Did the rocky planets get made? That's a great question. So we have our planetesimals, all these rocks that aren't really organized in the beginning of the solar system. And so these gas planets, they'll become large enough where they attracted other planetesimals through gravity and they were able to pull gas in. Well, the four rocky planets, they weren't heavy enough to be able to pull gas in, but they were able to pull in a lot of their own planetesimals. And so they got made in a similar fashion to all the gas planets, all the gas giants, except they just didn't bring in all the gas. They were just rock. Um, someone asked, how do planets compare with their regard to magnetic fields? What maintains a magnetic field? So I don't think Mercury has a magnetic field. Um, I feel like it has like sort of a pseudo magnetic field. It's kind of induced by radiation from the sun. Jasper. I can, I can maybe answer this one. one. I know this one well. Um, Mer Mercury actually does have a magnetic field. It has an intrinsic magnetosphere, much, much like Earth's actually. Um, it's just much smaller, of course. Um, Venus is uh, a bit of an odd duck. It has no magnetic field of any kind that we know of. Um, Mars um, does not have a big global magnetic field like the Earth, but it has small patches of magnetized rocks on the surface. Uh, Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field, um, the strongest uh, of any of the planets, and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have magnetic fields as well. So, so Venus is the only one that we know of that doesn't have uh, any intrinsic magnetic field of any kind, um, and Mars is sort of the, the, the second weakest because it's just got some little patches of rocks. Which planets, uh, someone asked, can have storms on them? That's a great question. Uh, really, any planet with an atmosphere can have a storm on it. Uh, I think that's really all that it takes is just having an atmosphere. Um, now, the weaker the atmosphere, the less powerful the storm is. Maybe a weak enough atmosphere may not render a storm at all. Um, but I think that just a prerequisite to have a storm is just to have an atmosphere. And anything can happen. Now, Jupiter is a much larger planet, and it has a much larger atmosphere, and so that's why they can have storms for centuries while our storms are only overnight. Um, I see one I see one question um, that we skipped over uh, a bit, which is this idea of, you know, um, have the planets in our solar system been a consistent group? Um, you know, we had Pluto, we removed Pluto. This was because um, the International Astronomical Union um, determined that you know, we need to come up with a firm definition for planet. And the three rules were, it needs to orbit the sun, it needs to um, be large enough that it has enough gravity that it forms itself into a sphere, and it also needs to clear its path as it orbits the sun. It needs to be relatively free of debris in doing so. Its gravity needs to kick out enough material from its path around the sun. And it was that third aspect uh, that Pluto was not quite up to snuff. And so it got kicked out with that Seriously. definition. And you so get this a lot in your classes? Um, <laughs> someone is not what? muted. I'm just going to try to hear. Um, everyone, if you would, make sure that you're muted. Um, but you know, other than Pluto, uh, you know, how is the naming of the planet or has the planets that belong to the solar system been consistent? And, you know, since ancient times, we knew about Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, absolutely. They're very easy to see in the night sky, and those were known to the ancients. Um, but it was, you know, in recent, um, you know, centuries that we added Mercury, Uranus to the list. Um, Uranus in particular, I think, was discovered in the 1600s, I want to say, well, it was discovered by uh, William Herschel, I believe, but I'm not sure if I've got that date right. Um, and then even later yet, um, as um, Cole mentioned, Neptune was discovered by math, not by observations, although afterwards we were able to observe it. Um, but their names, their names have changed through the years. Um, I think originally it was proposed that 
Uranus be named for King Charles or something like this, you know, depending on who the big figures were of the day. But for the most part, um, it's been pretty stable. Four or five known as long as humans have been around, a few more added in recent centuries. But then finally, you know, in the past couple of decades, we started discovering Vesta, Ceres, all these dwarf planets that um, Cole mentioned as well tonight. And this, at this time, when we were really starting to, you know, find objects that might make a 10th planet, an 11th planet, a 12th planet, that's when the International Astronomical Union had to really sit down and say, um, what are we going to call the definition of a planet? Well, that was wonderfully answered. Thank you. Oh, no, no. You, you've you done a great job as well, truly. Um, um, I'm trying to see if we've missed any others, but... Someone also, asked in the beginning um, how large Pluto was, and I did not forget about you. Oh. I just kind of had to look it up, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to do that right now, but I will later. Yeah, um, a little larger than the moon, right? But smaller than Mars? Yes, it's quite tiny. I, um, I'm just not... I, I don't know exact, but um, I will give you exact numbers. Um, now, someone asked, um, what keeps Saturn's rings from not becoming a part of Saturn itself? Wouldn't the gravitational pull be strong enough for those little rocks in the face of the planet? That's a great question. Um, now, there are certain distances that objects can kind of be away from anything to orbit around it. And you can think of an orb as it's just kind of falling past it. Instead of falling into it, it's just constantly falling past it. Um, and so a great example is the moon. The moon orbits Earth. It's not drawing into Earth in any way. And it's because it's at just the right distance where it's always been kind of falling past Earth. And it's the same way with, um, with Saturn's rings. While they're very tiny, they're far away enough where they're always going to be kind of falling past Saturn. But they're still close enough where they're bound to Saturn and they're not going to be moving away from Saturn. Um, okay. Here are aliens? And that's a, that's a lovely question. I do believe there's life out there. Um, now, how close are we to finding it and how far away is it? I don't know, but you could be the next person to find that out, so. That's right. Yeah. Let's, let's move on now to the second part of our evening. Thank you so much to Cole for that excellent talk and thank you to everyone for your great questions. No um, worries. I can um, also try to continue answering questions in the chat. Okay, yeah, that. just messaging back to people. That'd be great. That'd be great. Um, so continue to feel free to put your questions in the chat, um, and we'll have some more time for questions later on. Um, no, this is great. You've already met him, but I want to introduce you to Professor Jasper Halicus. He's on the faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Iowa. He's currently working on the development of TRACERS, um, which you may have heard of, which is the University of Iowa-led mission that last year won a $115 million uh, research award from NASA. This is the largest research grant that the University of Iowa has ever received. He also works on the MAVEN mission to Mars and the Parker Solar Probe mission to the Sun, along with other projects. Professor Halicus studies the solar wind and its interactions with objects in our solar system. All right, am I, uh, am I on deck? Yep. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's uh, exciting, exciting to see so many of you here for this uh, unique event. Um, we're all uh, kind of guinea pigs uh, seeing how this is gonna work. This is the first time we've, uh, we've done this, uh, so this is fun. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a tour through the solar system uh, a little bit like Cole did. Uh, Cole gave you a, a great introduction to uh, our solar system, uh, and I'm going to try not to cover all the same things that he did. Uh, in fact, I'm going to cover fewer things than he did, so I'm glad he, he covered a lot of the planets. Um, but I'm going to start in the same place that Cole did. It's hard to start a tour of the solar system without starting at the sun. Uh, so here are two views of the sun. Um, the left-hand view is what you would see if you looked at the sun with the naked eye. Um, please don't do this, you'll burn your retina. Um, uh, don't look at the sun without uh, proper uh, equipment. Um, but if you did look at it, it's, uh, it's fairly boring. It's kind of a, a featureless yellow thing um, with some little black spots here. These are called sunspots. Um, however, if you were gonna look at the sun 
uh, with a pair of UV goggles, like night vision goggles, um, or a spacecraft equipped with uh, a UV instrument, you would see something like the picture on the right. And you'll see uh, that the sun is, is not such a quiet and featureless thing at all. Uh, in fact, it's teeming with activity. And uh, these little black spots, when you look at them in the right wavelength, you can see that there are massive uh, features on the sun there, and it's teeming with activity. And furthermore, if you look around the edges of the disk of the sun, you can see that there's something extending up from the sun. And that's the corona, um, which Cole mentioned, uh, the atmosphere of the sun in a sense. And I wanna talk about that corona for a second. Um, so if you could block out the sun, um, say with something like the moon, uh, you could get a better view of this corona. Um, now this image has been a little bit enhanced, but uh, this is a real picture uh, of, a, of an eclipse. Um, and with the light of the sun blocked out, you can see the faint stuff around the edge. And you can see that there's this delicate filigree of magnetic fields extending up from the sun, uh, permeated um, by hot gas. Um, this is the corona. And the amazing thing about this corona is that it's way hotter than the rest of the sun. The surface of the sun, as Cole told you, is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This corona is a couple million degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and no one actually exactly knows how that can be. Um, it's not a usual thing um, that if you go above a hot object, it gets even hotter. If you put your hand above your stove, it's not 10 times as hot as the surface of the stove. So it's really kind of a weird thing. And uh, we don't know exactly why it is. Um, but it's the source uh, of a lot of interesting things in our solar system. Um, now, if we step still further back from this and block out a little bit more of the light and turn this into an animation, um, you can see that the corona is not just sitting still. Uh, in fact, there's material flowing out from the corona constantly. Uh, and it's flowing out not steadily and smoothly, but very dynamically. Um, this material is the solar wind. Uh, so the solar wind is a flow of hot, gas from the sun, so hot that the atoms have been stripped down to their constituent protons and electrons, and they flow out from the sun at about a million miles an hour, uh, and that's a real number. Um, so this um, wind, which I would, uh, I would argue with Cole is, is not so gentle at all, um, is, is flowing out vigorously from the sun, and it washes over everything in our solar system. Um, now, I'm not going to hit every one of the objects in our solar system, but uh, it affects them all. Uh, first of all, I'll say something about um, Parker Solar Probe. Uh, so we're still trying to learn how this solar wind actually gets accelerated up to a million miles an hour. Uh, and the way we're trying to learn how that works is we're sending a spacecraft um, right up close to the sun. Uh, and actually, um, about Five days ago, this spacecraft went closer to the sun than any man-made object has gone before, uh, about three times closer than Mercury. Now, we haven't gotten the data back from that flyby yet. Um, it has to get a little further from the sun before we can get all the bits back. Um, but we got a little beacon tone saying that the spacecraft is OK. Uh, and so we're hoping that we're going to learn amazing things about how the solar wind is accelerated from the sun. Um, I work on a little experiment, which is one of the bumps on the side of the spacecraft here, hiding behind this big heat shield um, that prevents us from melting when we go by the sun. Okay, but let's, let's talk about um, where the solar wind flows as it goes out from the sun. One of the things that it flows past, as, as Cole mentioned beautifully, uh, is comets. And I understand that you guys are going to get to look at a comet tonight. Um, it probably won't look as awesome as this one. Um, comet Hale-Bopp was, was one of the most spectacular comets that um, have been in our skies in recent memory. Um, some of you might be old enough to remember this. Uh, I am, uh, sad to say. Um, it was quite a sight. Um, the thing I wanna talk about though is, is what you see here is it actually has two tails. Um, people know that comets have tails, but not everyone knows that they have two tails. One of these tails, the white one here, is the dust tail. Those are bits of dust and ice and things um, that are um, being ablated from the comet, and they're following trajectories under the influence of gravity. Uh, and they don't go straight out from the comet. They kind of curve around, and they orbit around the sun, and they follow behind the comet. This other tail, though, this blue tail, this is the so-called gas tail, or ion tail, and that tail, is being swept away by the solar wind. And in fact, that tail 
is one of our first indications that the solar wind existed. Um, long before we could send up spacecraft to measure the solar wind, we were able to observe comets and we were able to see this tail. And that tail, in fact, was, was really the first evidence that there was such a thing as the solar wind. Now, those tails, um, just as the solar wind itself is not always quiescent and steady, these tails are not always quiescent and steady. Uh, sometimes a discontinuity will come past and this tail will actually completely break off. This is called a disconnection event. Uh, so these are four frames of a disconnection event. One, two, three, four. And you can see here's your comet. Here's this tail being blown off by the solar wind. And then you see a little kink develop here. And that kink propagates down the tail of the comet. And eventually, the whole thing breaks off. Now, you can actually use this to time the solar wind. And so by looking at comets, you can even measure how fast the solar wind is going. So even before we were able to make measurements in space, we had an idea that there was a flow of solar wind uh, going a million miles an hour, um, which I think is a triumph of observational astronomy. OK, I'm going to move out a little farther. Well, the comets can be anywhere, um, but uh, this one is quite close. I'm going to move out to Mars, though, um, and I'm going to show you a picture of Mars. Now, you might be wondering why I'm showing you a picture uh, of geology and a talk on the solar wind, um, but I promise I'll connect it up. Uh, I am not a geologist, um, but I can tell two things from looking at this picture. One thing I can tell is that at some point on Mars, there had to be liquid water flowing around because you can see things that look like river beds here and uh, even what look like large lake beds. Uh, another kind of flow channel over here. However, another thing I can tell from looking at this picture is that there has not been water on Mars in quite a long time. Because the other thing I can see is I can see these kind of holes. These are impact craters formed by rocks slamming into the surface of Mars. And this happens to every planet. It happens to the Earth as well over the course of solar system's history. Uh, but on Earth, the effects of uh, uh, water flowing around and erosion and winds and atmosphere have erased these signatures. On Mars, that hasn't happened, which means that there hasn't been much atmosphere or water there for billions of years. So where did that water go? Where did that atmosphere go? Well, it can basically go down or it can go up. We have rovers on the surface that are telling us it probably didn't go down into the rocks. Um, so the other place that it can go is it can go out into space. And one of the ways that it can go into space is by being stripped away by the solar wind. So this is the solar wind flowing past Mars. Uh, it forms a bow shock here because uh, it's like a jet plane going uh, at supersonic speed. So you get a, a shock. Uh, and then it strips away material from the atmosphere. So these colored particles are particles of gas being stripped away from the atmosphere of Mars. Um, much like a comet, but uh, a little bit different than a comet. This is actually uh, like the comet tail of a planet. Uh, in fact, we call it a magneto tail. Uh, so um, we also have uh, a spacecraft which is observing this. Uh, so this is the MAVEN spacecraft, uh, which stands for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution. And no, I didn't make up that acronym. <laughs> Not my favorite. Um, uh, it turns out that when you, uh, when you make a, a, a mission um, for NASA, you always have to come up with a fancy acronym, though. It seems to be a rule. Um, anyway, I, I work on uh, this little box right here. Um, and uh, we're, MAVEN is still in orbit around Mars, and we're still learning a lot from it about how the solar wind uh, affects planets. OK, so let's, let's finish up by bringing this back to home. Let's come back to Earth. What does the solar wind do at Earth? Well, one thing that the solar wind does at Earth is it creates beautiful displays. Um, so uh, it's not often that you get to see uh, Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights in Iowa, but it can happen. Uh, I've never been lucky enough to see the Northern, Northern Lights in Iowa. Um, this is a picture where someone was lucky enough to catch them. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see the Northern Lights at more northerly latitudes, uh, but it's a beautiful display. And this display is uh, completely created by the energy in the solar wind. Here's another view of the Northern Lights, which I particularly like. This is taken from the International Space Station. 
uh, and uh, this is what the northern lights look like from above. What you're seeing here is you're seeing energetic electrons which are slamming down into the atmosphere and depositing so much energy that they're producing light from the atmosphere there. Now those electrons themselves don't come from the solar wind, but the energy that accelerates them and provides this energy comes from the solar wind. So one solar wind impacted Earth is to create these beautiful displays. There are other impacts though, which are not so benign. So here's another impact of the solar wind at Earth. These are high voltage transformers that were melted um, when a solar storm impacted the Earth and uh, deposited a ton of energy um, in power lines. Uh, now, if you try to uh, drive a very vigorous current down a power line, you can melt these high voltage transformers. What do these do? Well, these transformers transform the current that is carried in a high voltage power line down to the current that runs in your house and allows you to run your lights and your computer and your internet and everything. Um, turns out to be much more efficient to run power in the power lines at high voltage, but you don't want high voltage coming out of your wall plug. So uh, high voltage transformers are very important in our power grid. Um, a solar storm can take out these high voltage transformers though. Um, and back in the 80s, um, it actually took out uh, almost an entire province. Uh, so this is a, a night sky image um, of the uh, uh, North American continent. Um, and you might recognize some bits if you look here. This is kind of the Eastern seaboard. Uh, this is one of the Great Lakes over here. But what you'll notice is that above this line here, there's no light. And that's because a solar storm took out the entire power grid in all of Quebec. Uh, and this was um, in the late 80s that this happens. Now, this obviously isn't something that happens every day, um, hasn't happened in, in very recent memory, um, but it's something that would be really catastrophic if it happened today. And so we'd like to understand better um, when and how this can happen. So one way that um, we're gonna do that is using this new mission called Tracers, which Caroline mentioned. And I just wanna clarify that, that I am not the lead investigator of Tracers. I'm just, just one of many investigators. Um, so, so the man who has that $115 million to his name is Professor Craig Kletzing, um, but I'm lucky enough to be a member of the team. Um, and what Tracers is gonna be is we're, we're gonna have two spacecraft and we're gonna fly them right through this special region called the cusp. And this cusp is kind of a funnel. It's a funnel that connects the Earth out to the solar wind. Uh, and the solar wind energy um, can be uh, conducted down this funnel. And by observing at this special location, we can understand the processes by which the solar wind uh, influences the Earth. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to better predict uh, events um, that might take out our power grid or something like that. Okay, so uh, I just wanna quickly end on a powers of 10 plot. I love powers of 10 plots. Um, so this uh, plot from left to right is not on a linear scale. Every tick mark along it goes up by a factor of 10. Uh, so the sun over on the left is where the solar wind is flowing out from. It flows past the Earth um, at one here, goes past Mars and Jupiter, and then Saturn is at 10. Neptune, Pluto, it's an old chart. Pluto's still on here. I still like Pluto even if they don't call it a planet anymore. Um, when you get out to 100, you're getting out to the, the end of the range of influence of the solar wind. At that point, the solar wind runs out of oomph and it runs into the interstellar medium. Um, and uh, if you keep on going out there even farther, another two powers of 10, you get to this uh, Oort cloud um, that Cole also mentioned. And if you go another power of 10 and a little bit more, you get out to the nearest star. Um, so I, I love this plot because it shows both how huge the solar system is and how small it is. Uh, so the Earth is over here at one, the solar system goes out to a couple hundred, but then you have to go out to a couple hundred thousand before you get out to the nearest star. Uh, so I'll end there and I'll happily take questions. So 
people are welcome to unmute themselves to give a question. And, yeah, and I see present. some here in the in chat, chat, but it looks like Cole okay. has already been answering most of them. Uh, I see a question about the Oort cloud. Does the sun's gravity pull on the Oort cloud? It, it does. It's, it's very, very, very weak, but it does still have an influence on the Oort cloud. And, and every once in a while, uh, we think uh, a comet will even get um, knocked out of the Oort cloud by some kind of you know, disturbance or something, and then it will get pulled in uh, to the sun. So some of the comets that we see do, we think, come from the Oort cloud. I have a question. If, yeah. if the energy, you said that the energy that's coming from the solar wind that causes the aurora is not electrons, it's energy. What does that energy form in and that causes the aurora lights? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple different forms to, to the energy in the solar wind. Um, a lot of the energy in the solar wind is carried in charged particles, electrons and protons. There's also energy carried in electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and, and all of those um, have an influence on the magnetosphere uh, of the Earth, the magnetic bubble of the Earth. But most of those particles don't themselves come all the way down and form the aurora. They uh, produce disturbances in the magnetic fields, which then cause electrons to be accelerated down. So it's sort of a, a multi-step process. It's a great question. Thank you. All right, now they're coming in fast and furious. Is it possible to communicate with spacecraft if it was sent to Alpha Centauri? Uh, absolutely, if you've got a, got a big enough dish and the spacecraft has a big enough dish, you can do it. Uh, the only problem is that as far as we know, you can only send information at the speed of light. Uh, and so it would take you about four years um, to get a signal each way. And are Mercury and Venus affected by the solar winds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mercury and Venus are affected by the solar wind in, in very different ways, though. Um, so Mercury is, is kind of a, a baby brother to the Earth. Mercury has... Uh, an internal magnetic field, which forms, you know, kind of a bar magnet field, much like the Earth does. And so it, it has a little magnetosphere or a magnetic bubble around the planet um, like the Earth. Venus does not, because Venus doesn't have a magnetic field of its own, but Venus has such a thick um, atmosphere that there are currents that are produced um, in that atmosphere that still provide kind of a magnetic bubble around Venus. Um, so the Detailed physics of the interaction is very different, but the end result is quite similar. There's kind of a magnetic bubble and a magnetic tail. Does burying the electric wires prevent the damage to the transformers? Not, not really, because it's, it's an induction effect. So you don't have to be directly um, you know, touching uh, to, to get the, the current generated in the wires. Um, so burying them doesn't do a lot. Um, however, there, there are things that you can do um, to protect the transformers, which we've gotten better at doing over the years. Um, but, but really what you want to have is a, a predictive capability. You want to know when there's a solar event coming, and then you just switch the transformers off and they're fine. Um, if they're not actually hooked to the power grid when the solar storm hits, then, you know, no big deal. So that's what we'd, we'd really like to be able to do is to, is to have that predictive capability. Is solar wind an issue for spacecraft? Um, not typically. Um, if you built a spacecraft the wrong way, um, then solar wind could be an issue um, because you could get um, uh, charging of different parts of the spacecraft that would produce electric fields that would um, short out and, and arc and damage sensitive electronics. Um, but we, these days we know how to build spacecraft so that those things don't happen. So the, the solar wind itself is not an issue. Um, now the sun sometimes spits out some stuff that's a little bit nastier than the solar wind though. So the, the sun will sometimes produce very, very uh, energetic particles, um, sometimes from solar flares, uh, and those can be dangerous to spacecraft. All right, Cole's helping me answer questions. Thank you, Cole. Uh, where on the Powers of 10 chart is Voyager? So Voyager's right out here by the, the heliopause.
laws. Um, in fact, in, in the past um, decade or so, uh, we think that both, both of the Voyager spacecraft have gone through the heliopause. So they're, they're right out here at about 200 on this, um, on this chart. Is the cusp a result of the Earth's magnetic field? It, it is, um, largely. Um, in, in some sense, it's a result of, of adding the Earth's magnetic field and the magnetic field in the solar wind together, though. So it's a, it's a collaboration between the solar wind and the Earth. Was the event in the 1980s a solar flare similar to the Carrington event? Uh, so someone has, has done their background reading and, and knows a little bit about this, and um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the event in the 1980s wasn't even close to the Carrington event. So, so the Carrington event is, is, as far as we know, the, the biggest thing that has, has hit um, the Earth in the, in the modern era, at least. Um, the Carrington event was so strong that um, power grids actually caught on fire across the country. Telegraph lines caught on fire. Um, the Carrington event was strong enough that there were uh, aurora seen in the tropics. Um, the event in the 1980s um, was not as strong as the Carrington event. Um, how was it localized to Northeast Canada? Um, Northeast Canada happens to be close to the auroral oval, which is where uh, a lot of the um, auroral energy comes down. So, so those kinds of latitudes tend to be um, most hard hit by these things. Ooh, good question from Flash. Is there a star bigger than the sun? It turns out there are lots of stars bigger than the sun. Um, in, in fact, the sun is, is sort of very unimpressive as far as stars go. Um, and I think uh, maybe tomorrow you guys are gonna talk about stars. So if you have a chance to, to come back tomorrow, um, you might learn a lot more about stars. But it, it turns out that our sun is actually very unimpressive as far as stars go. In fact, technically it's a dwarf star. Um, now, most stars are either dwarf stars or giant stars. There doesn't seem to be in anything in between. Um, so that just means it's not one of the really big ones, but uh, you know, our star is very middle of the road. Um, another fantastic question. Why was Mars's atmosphere more affected by solar winds than the Earth's? Um, there are a couple of answers to this, and we don't actually know which one is most important. Um, one answer is that Mars does not have a strong magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic field may help shield the atmosphere from the solar wind. Another reason is that Mars is just a little bit smaller, and its gravity is not quite as strong, and it's just not quite able to hold on to its atmosphere as well as uh, the Earth is. We actually don't currently know which one of those is the most important. It's a very active field of study. So it's uh, such a good question, I can't even answer it. Um, Caroline, you tell me when we have to stop. I'll just keep answering questions. You're muted. We have a few more minutes. We're going to have to start the observations a little later than I initially thought. So we've probably got five, maybe even 10 more minutes. All right, then keep them coming, folks. That, are we prepared for another Carrington event? Um, probably not. Uh, another Carrington event would probably do pretty significant damage to uh, our power grids. Um, is it likely that we'll have another Carrington event in the near future? Probably not very. Um, however, in 2012, um, there was a flare comparable to the one that caused the Carrington event. Uh, it just happened to be on the other side of the sun and it went the other direction. So it's, it's not out of the question, um, but uh, it's, you know, it's not a high probability uh, event. Um, on the other hand, some of us thought a global pandemic was not a high probability event. So you know, it's one of those things we might want to be prepared for. How can we live here? Many question marks. Um, I don't know. I think it's a pretty nice place to live personally. <laughs> I may have missed the point of that question. I am seven years old and I'm wondering what would happen if the sun exploded. Um, well, I, I don't think you have to worry about that happening anytime soon. Um, it's likely to be billions of years um, before uh, we have to worry about the sun exploding. Um, but if it did, it would be bad for the earth. Um, I think there's little doubt about that. 
how many satellites do we have watching the sun? More than I can probably count. Um, NASA has this wonderful chart that they put up of, of all the current operating missions. Um, and there's about a hundred on there. Now, not all of those are directly observing the sun. Some of them are looking at the earth and, and other aspects, but um, uh, certainly I would say there's on the order of, of a dozen missions that are focused on the sun. Tell us more about tracers. Um, what would you like to know? I can tell you what the acronym stands for. <laughs> tracers is uh, tandem reconnection and cusp electrodynamics reconnaissance satellites. Uh, and I did come up with that acronym. Um, we had a competition within our team to, uh, to decide what the acronym from the mission for the mission would be. And uh, for coming up with, with the one that was chosen, uh, I was uh, given a bottle of wine. So um, it worked out for me. Uh, how is the asteroid belt affected by solar wind? That's a really good question. Um, and um, the answer is that it probably depends on the asteroid. Um, the, the small asteroids probably um, don't much notice the solar wind going by. Uh, they charge up a little bit because of the charged particles hitting them. Um, however, the large asteroids uh, in particular, some of the very large ones that Cole mentioned, uh, we actually think that some of those might have a very, very tenuous atmosphere. Um, there are some observations that suggest that Ceres in particular uh, has a tenuous water atmosphere, and, and that does um, uh, interact with the solar wind. Um, so, uh, you know, the asteroids are not all um, dead rocks. Uh, there's another asteroid called Psyche, um, which we're actually currently building a mission to go and visit. And the reason that we want to visit Psyche is that we think it's a pure um, chunk of iron, basically. Uh, and uh, we think it is, is basically an ancient core of a planetesimal, uh, which is another thing that, that Cole mentioned. Um, and if that's true, we think it might have a very strong magnetic field, in which case it would, it would interact very strongly with the solar wind. Uh, there's a question about the recording. I think part of this was recorded. Is that right, Caroline? Yeah, we started the recording just before the end of Cole's talk, I believe. Yeah. Okay. We'll so partly. Iron out the issues for tomorrow. Yeah, I, I think what happened there was that because I logged in first, it got all mucked up. So it's my fault. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not. I should have gone <laughs> sooner. It's all good. It's Zoom's fault. We'll blame it on Zoom. <laughs> That's right. Is anyone in the Midwest studying the solar wind uh, as a source for energy on Earth or for space travel? Um, I don't know. Um, I know that people have thought about using the solar wind uh, as a propulsion source. Uh, in fact, my, my former uh, colleague at the University of Washington worked on this for many years. So this, this is actually something that um, people are thinking about. Uh, I don't know that anyone in the Midwest is working on that problem, but it could be. How far apart are asteroids and the asteroid belt? Um, there's no one answer to that. It's it, there's sort of uh, a lot of the little ones are very randomly distributed through the asteroid belt. Um, however, as as Cole pointed out um, very well, um, they're not actually all that close to each other. It's not like you. Uh, it's not like the scene in Star Wars where you're flying through and like you're dodging between asteroids that are all within 10 feet of your spacecraft. They're a little more spaced out than that. Uh, what is a solar minimum and how might it affect us this winter? Um, so uh, the, the sun goes through cycles. Um, every 22 years, uh, it goes through a cycle. And uh, every 11 years, uh, it goes through a solar minimum. And every 11 years, it goes through a solar maximum. So why did I say 22 years? Uh, it's because there's a, a polarity um, flip in those minima and maxima. Uh, and those, those minima and maxima are basically minima and maxima of, of solar activity. So during solar minimum, there's very few sunspots. There are very few solar events. Um, 
It has only a very weak effect on climate though. The total solar irradiance does not change very much with solar cycle. Um, so there, there is a, a very weak connection to climate, but um, I, it, it's not to the degree that we should really notice the difference this winter. These are great questions. I can, I can barely keep up with all these questions. There's so many good ones. Uh, has there been any progress made in predicting the location and or severity of sunspots? Are there certain areas of the sun more likely to have this kind of activity? So this, this question actually fits really well with the previous one because this, this depends on the solar cycle. Um, the, the location of the sunspots and how severe they are basically goes with this 22 uh, year solar cycle. And so as the, as the solar cycle changes, the sunspots actually change the latitude uh, that they're at on the sun. Um, and so during some parts of the solar cycle, you'll see them near the equator. At other times, you'll see them near the pole of the sun. And we do understand in a general sense what that trend is. It doesn't mean that we can say, uh, you know, in November of this year, there will be a sunspot right here. But statistically speaking, we know where they're likely to be. How were we able to observe the solar flare on the opposite side of the sun? Good question. Um, we have a couple of spacecraft out there called Stereo, which are actually looking at the sun um, from different places than from the Earth. So we're actually able to see solar flares that come out on different parts of the sun. What level of impact do we think the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field might have? Um, so that's, that's a really cool question. It's actually like something that people are writing scientific papers about right now. Um, because uh, when you turn the Earth's magnetic field off during a reversal, in some sense, Earth becomes like Mars. And so a question that people are asking is, does that mean that we would lose a whole bunch of atmosphere um, during that reversal? The answer is probably not so much that we would notice it because the reversal takes place over a time scale of thousands of years, which sounds like a long time, but is actually a really short time in terms of planetary evolution. So probably, you know, even if we lose a whole bunch of atmosphere during that time period, it's, it's really a blip in the overall evolution of our climate. Oh, thank you for Cole. Cole uh, went and counted the number of satellites designed to monitor our sun. And it was even more than I thought. Um, fantastic. And Jasper, maybe one more question. OK. Um, I'm trying to see a question here that I can answer. I have no idea what the interstellar medium G cloud is. Does anybody else want to take that? I, um, I looked it up. I, I can't find it either. Um, so um, Maybe a little bit more information. And I'm sure we'd be happy to help you out. Yeah. Hey, congratulations, you have stumped us. That's right. Um, Cole and Professor uh, Halicus know this, but the interstellar medium is the gas and dust between the stars and our Milky Way galaxy. Um, but as for specifically the interstellar medium G cloud, yeah, we're not sure. We'll talk a little bit more about the interstellar medium on June 26th on our third observation night. Okay, so I'm going to get this up over here. Well, thank you so much to um, Professor Halicus. That was almost 20 minutes of questions, so thank you so much for that. I know everyone really appreciated it. That was great, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the observation part of our evening. Um, and I want, you want to, see this, Stuart? I want to introduce you. Um, there might be someone who's not muted. Everyone just check to make sure that um, your audio is muted. Um, the Iowa Robotic Observatory is located in Senoida, Arizona. 
It's very close to Tucson, um, but it's quite a ways from Iowa. Um, we travel there a couple times a year, a year to do maintenance, but for the most part, we operate it entirely robotically. So this isn't even a remote observation like we're going to be doing tonight. Remote observation is where you log in over the internet to control a telescope and do observations. But instead, the majority of the time, the Iowa Robotic Observatory, um, which is a part of the larger Weiner Observatory. If you see down at the bottom left, this is the observatory where our Iowa Robotic Observatory is located. Um, uh, typically, the observations of the Iowa Robotic Observatory are robotic. We're not even logging in. Um, there's software that's been written to control this telescope so that really with just pretty much a click of the button every night, the telescope can go off on its own and do all the observations throughout the evening without a human needing to intervene at all. Um, for the sake of this night, we are going to control it remotely where we can kind of see and choose where we want to go and so on and so forth. But on an average night, this telescope is doing all the observing on its own. Um, our particular telescope, the University of Iowa's telescope, is called Gemini. And this is the telescope that you see there on the right. Um, a little confusing because there's a very famous telescope named Gemini um, in Hawaii and Chile, Gemini North and South. Um, these two telescopes um, are, you know, big research telescopes, but just as Gemini North and South and Hawaii and Chile um, are called this because there are two telescopes that are very similar in design and operation in both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, uh, acting as twins, um, the name Gemini being the constellation of the twins. Um, we too have named our telescope uh, Gemini because of this situation where the Gemini Telescope at the Iowa Robotic Observatory operates very similarly to an observatory that we have here on campus. If you've ever been to one of our public observing nights on campus, you would have seen the twin of this Gemini Telescope, the Van Allen Observatory Telescope. Um, really briefly, let's look at the Iowa Robotic Observatory Telescope. We've got our half meter primary mirror light comes into the telescope and collects on that mirror at the back of the telescope there. Then light bounces off of that mirror and hits the secondary mirror up at the top on the truss of the telescope. Light bounces off that mirror and travels through a hole in the primary mirror down at the bottom. Then that light coming from the stars or the objects that you're observing will next hit a filter wheel where we put um, certain filters that are going to block out particular colors of light that are of most interest to us for a particular observation. And finally, the light's collected on the camera, the CCD camera that um, the um, observations um, are going to be uh, recorded from. We have a mount that controls and points the telescope. And we also have a focuser that essentially moves the distance between the primary and secondary mirror and the camera to, as the days go by and the atmosphere changes, the exact separation of the different parts of the optics is going to change. And the ideal separation to bring our objects from the night sky most into focus will change as well. So the focuser is located there to um, help us get the sharpest images possible. And with that, I'm going to try to turn our screen over to the desktop of the um, computer that controls the Iowa Robotic Observatory. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see here, we have um, at the top right, a window that shows where on the sky the telescope is pointing. 
So the night sky is seen on this uh, circle here. Um, the purple, um, let's see. The purple uh, little crosshair shows where you would like the telescope to move to, while the yellow crosshair shows where the telescope is actually pointing. On the left, we have some software that will show us the images that we take tonight. And then at the bottom there, you can see, conveniently covered by a spider web, it looks like, we can see the telescope itself. So in a moment, we'll move to our first target, and you'll actually be able to see the telescope in that little um, camera view down at the bottom move to its location. So the first thing that we're going to do is type in the coordinates of comet pan stars. Now comet pan stars is discovered by a um, survey that's looking for asteroids that might you know threaten the earth or run into the earth and um, in the process they do discover some comets sometimes and so that is why this comet um, has the name pan stars. There's a number of a number of different comet pan stars. So what I'm entering right now are what we call the celestial coordinates of the object on this particular comet. Um, celestial coordinates are kind of like GPS directions on Earth. Um, every single object in the sky has a telephone number, if you will, or a GPS coordinate, latitude, longitude, but in the sky that tells us exactly where the object is. So at the top, I've got my right ascension, and at the bottom, I have my declination. Right ascension is very similar to latitude. Declination is very, oh, uh, right ascension is very similar to longitude. Declination is very similar to latitude. Okay, now that we've got it entered, I'm going to say go to, and so you'll see the yellow um, position where the telescope is actually pointing. We'll move to the position we're curious about that we want to go see, and then um, look into the bottom and you can actually see the telescope moving. This comet is currently in the constellation Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. Um, However, comets like planets, like asteroids, are so close that they appear to move in the sky. So in a couple months, in a couple weeks, uh, this comet will no longer be in Ursa Major. It will have moved through the sky. Okay, so we're going to take a 122nd image of this comet, and we're going to do it um, with no filter. We want to get all the light that we can because it's a pretty, it's a pretty dim target. So by selecting this L filter, that essentially means there's no filter. We're not going to block out any of the colors of light. Anyone have any questions about comets while we wait for this to come up? Oh, well, I will say that um, someone posed a good question of what planets can we see tonight? And very unfortunately, it's a bad, it's a bad time of year for planet observing. Um, if we waited up until morning, we would be able to see um, some planets in the sky. But um, this evening, there really aren't any to observe at all. This fall will be nice. We'll be able to see Jupiter and Saturn pretty much every night at good times.
you can see down um, in the bottom right of the video camera, there's um, a little box there that we use to store some cords and power supplies for operating the telescope. But inside there, we actually have um, a spectrometer. So a device that takes the light from the object that you're studying and breaks it up into a rainbow. Um, and I need to email or text um, our observatory manager and say, please, pretty please, would you close the door to the cabinet? Because you can see from this video, the door is swung wide open and we're getting dust in there on our spectrometer. It's not good. Okay, so when I adjust the contrast there, which is how dark the darks are and how bright the brights are, um, we can see at the center there, that little fuzzy, fuzzy blob, fuzzy speck is the comet Panstars. So we will go ahead and move on to our second object as soon as I save this image for anyone who would like to um, get a copy of it. Okay, so our next target is going to be M81, Messier 81, Bode's Galaxy. Um, in the past, it used to be known as Bode's Nebula. Um, this is because, um, you know, back in the day when they were catalog cataloging objects, nebula, regions um, where um, there's a lot of gas and dust, where stars are formed and born, looked very similar to a lot of other objects. Um, if there was some things that we call planetary nebulae, we'll talk about this on um, June 26th, but they are not um, nebulae at all. They are middle-sized stars that have died, similar to our sun, sloughed off their outer layers, and have left um, this remnant in the sky. Um, these planetary nebulae were fuzzy things, nebulous things that sort of looked like a planet. They had a diameter, they had a size. Um, and so they got lumped into nebulae too, just like these regions where um, stars uh, were born in dusty clouds. But then also galaxies, um, objects way outside of our own Milky Way galaxy looked fuzzy, nebulous. And so, you know, Bode's galaxy was originally classified as a nebula, this sort of catch-all of objects that looked very similar, but ended up being really separate things. So Bode's galaxy um, was requested by Elizabeth and Carl Snipes for us to observe tonight. Um, this also was uh, requested by a second person in a way. Um, Lincoln Munt um, uh, requested that um, I would like to see the closest galaxy to us. Well, the closest galaxy to us, Andromeda, is actually not viewable at this time. So of all the galaxies that are in the sky viewable at this time, Bode's galaxy is the closest one. So in some ways, um, this request also comes from Lincoln Munt. Um, again, just to be clear, we're leaving the solar system at this point. Um, we've observed this comet here in our own solar system, um, but there aren't any planets up for us to observe. So we're going to shift gears entirely and observe some different things. We're going to leave our solar system. Furthermore, we're even going to leave our galaxy and we're gonna look at other galaxies outside of our own. So again, we'll type in the coordinates of where we want to go, the latitude and longitude, the right ascension and declination.
this time we'll do a shorter exposure, one minute, and this time we can filter the image. We're going to choose a red filter, so we're going to block out all the light except for the red colors, the red wavelengths. I see the chat is very active, fantastic. So again, Lincoln Munt asked, you know, I want to see the closest galaxy to us. Um, the Andromeda galaxy is the closest large galaxy to us. Um, but this, this object, and Andromeda is about 2.5 um, million light years away. Um, this object is 12 million light years away. So about five times the distance of Andromeda. Okay, and there's M81, Bode's galaxy. Okay, and for our final object of the night, we're going to check out another galaxy. So again, not in the solar system at all, in fact, almost well, not almost, but certainly far away from the solar system. Not as far as you can get, but pretty far. Um, so we're going to look at the Whirlpool Galaxy, or M51, Messier 51. And again, a 60 second exposure in the R filter should be sufficient. Um, this object is in the constellation Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, and it's 23 million light years away. So almost twice the distance of the Bode's galaxy. And what you'll see is this galaxy appears a lot bigger. It's going to fill a lot more of our camera. And if it's twice the distance of Bode's galaxy, but it looks bigger, that means it must truly be huge because the further away something is, the smaller it will appear to look. But even though this is further, it still looks bigger. So it must be um, much larger in size.
both these galaxies actually have close companion galaxies. And so Bode's galaxy also has Messier 82 very nearby. Um, I believe it's called the Needle Galaxy. Um, and so if you're looking through a telescope with an eyepiece and you have a very wide field of view, sometimes you can see both M81 and, and M82 in the same field of view. But with um, the Whirlpool Galaxy, there's again an interacting galaxy that's very, well, uh, M81 and M82 possibly aren't interacting. But in the case of the Whirlpool Galaxy, um, the different galaxies really are interacting. Um, and I'm going to try to get the contrast good because you really can see the spiral arms in this spiral galaxy if we get the contrast right. That's okay, right? You can kind of see the spiral arms swirling out from the Whirlpool Galaxy. But as I said, um, you know, this, this lower bright spot where you can see the spiral arms coming out, that itself is really um, M51. And up above it, that's a whole different galaxy that's interacting, that it's interacting with. So that brighter dot up above it is um, a galaxy that um, has, you know, partly begun to collide with the Whirlpool galaxy. And there are, um, you know, portions of the spiral arms that are intertwined and the gas and dust are mixing. Okay, so at this point, that really concludes our evening. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out. Thank you so much, Cole, for your talk. Thank you to Professor Halicus. Um, it's been a really wonderful evening, um, made most wonderful by all of you being here. We really hope that you'll join us for um, our upcoming events, one tomorrow night and then two in two weeks. Thank you all so much. I hope that everyone has a wonderful, wonderful night. Yeah, thank you. You guys have been a wonderful audience. I had a great time answering your questions and thank you for providing um, all of them. It was, this was really wonderful. Thank you.